need an air plant, but we're not going to reach the hospital. Oh, sorry. 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 Oh, the prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. We'd like to welcome the island okay. planning and the mainland planning okay. commissions. Uh, you asked for some okay. specific information for today, and uh, Jimmy will be providing that to you. Just uh, a couple of uh, informal announcements. Uh, the ladies' room is right out this, the side of the door, and then right down that little hallway there as you go into the main lobby. It's right on the right there, and then the men's room is right across the way if you can use that. We have snacks and food, uh, things for you to, to uh, eat and choose, that's fine. Um, like the first of all, start off with just uh, so everyone can uh, get familiar and start um, our commission. And uh, I'm Don Elliott, the chairman, and uh, start with uh, Mr. Browning, Dave. Ford and Cliff Adams from our commission. So uh, I'll let Desiree. Okay, if you want to just introduce yourselves. Joel Willis. Odessa Willis. Patrick Duncan. Desiree Watson, <coughs> Chair. Stan Humphrey. Vice Chair. Ed Meadows. Gene Lee. Uh, Bill Edgy. Gary Neville, Chairman Mainland. Tim Market. And with that, we'll start with Mr. Young. Okay, well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone and provide some responses this morning about from the specific questions you guys had. And I took the liberty to make an outline of what I'll be talking about. And on the back pages are copies of the questions that uh, were pre submitted. And I've tried my best to give you a perspective as we see it. So, thank you. Do you have an excellent one? Yeah. Carl. combining the city and the county's utilities back in 2008. Uh, since that time, they uh, changed and had went from a five-person uh, commission to a seven-person commission to get a little more, a little broader representation uh, out in the community. Uh, certainly, the, the current forum is a pretty high-functioning group. We've got a lot of uh, very 
knowledgeable, experienced members on our commission that bring a lot of expertise from the technical and financial realm to the, to the board. It's really been a, a big help in a lot of areas for us. Um, a few quick facts about our utility. Uh, the fact is that we have 30,000 counts approximately in our, in our utility. Uh, probably have 80, 85, maybe 90,000 total residents in our county. Uh, so we do the arithmetic, uh, 20,000 of those counts residential, 10,000 of them uh, commercial or industrial. There's a big chunk of our population that don't receive any direct services from us or not billed by us in any way, shape, or form. So you can see we've got a big mission to serve the county as a whole, and only a fraction of our community has actually uh, got skin in the game, so to speak, when it comes, while that's true, everybody benefits from this utility being here, everybody. Either through the building for their employer's function because they use the service indirectly when they go out uh, in the community to do other things. Uh, Joel Water Sewer inherited uh, a, a kind of a collage of issues, uh, as you might expect, when they were formed. Uh, the list in front of you, rolling stock had aged. There was a lot of trucks and vehicles that were in really poor shape. We're still struggling to get ahead of that uh, as I speak. Fixed assets had been allowed uh, to get, um, get into poor condition. Like all the utilities around the country, we've got a situation where, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Everybody understands that about a, a water and sewer utility. It's always easier to, for the folks that are in charge of the money and policymakers to Fix the things they can see, things that the citizens see, the streets, uh, roads, bridges, signals, things that drainage, things that are above ground and obvious to them. Uh, but the water and sewer part, uh, like in most communities around the country, with some few exceptions, uh, has seen decades and decades of neglect or, or poor maintenance, to say the least. Uh, anyway, so we, we've got issues out there in that regard. Poor asset documentation, certainly a lot of the assets were transferred. The documentation that was incomplete or, or incorrect. Uh, we had personality issues from the staff that came on board employee problems initially, and I think the folks that preceded me have done a pretty good job of figuring out where to give people better opportunities to be to help us succeed in a better way. Disjointed systems of the combined, that were combined, the water systems and the sewer systems for the county uh, were being constructed and designed over time. Weren't, nobody was sitting around thinking, oh, one of these days we're going to have to hook up with the city figuring out when and where to do that, how that would all work together. So they're not really, at this point, uh, synergistic, as you would expect uh, a, a water and sewer system to be. The redundancy, particularly on the water side, to provide better fire protection, better overall level of service, is just starting to come into play. We're, we're starting to make cross connections and start to look at the modeling of our, hydraulic modeling of our system see what we can do to make our system <coughs> functional for our citizens. Heavy debt service uh, versus the uh, small customer base. One of the things we also inherited was a uh, $50 million in debt for a small utility like this. For a small utility like this, that's a lot of debt. 30,000 customers shouldering $30 million, I mean $50 million debt was, was a big burden to get started on, and not tremendous reserves set up to help them out. Uh, growth pressures, one of the things I've stressed since I've been here is there, there's always that demand for us to provide capacity in water and sewer. One of the things about a, a 
fairly low density uh, population here in our county. It's in fact, uh, we're being spread <coughs> in all directions. Developments are not following a, a, a corridor in one direction where we can concentrate our small population. The population is spread out everywhere. We're going north, we're going west, we're going south, and we're trying to do expansion needs in, out on St. Simon Islands and keep up with it all at the same time, which really spreads resources and makes it much more difficult for us to get all this done. Excuse me. Uh, initial authority was pretty weak, so they didn't make some of the big decisions they would have if they had been a little bit stronger uh, getting started. A lot of contractual liabilities were inherited by the, by the utility. Underfunded reserves, as I mentioned. Fee structures weren't adequate to cover some of the costs. Uh, again, that's something that's pretty a dominant thing or a common thing across the country that utilities all across the country, with some exceptions, have been apt to undercharge for what they were doing. Undercharge for uh, capacity and future taps or future uh, improvements weren't being charged properly against new development. It's a case that's repeated over and over around the country. Uh, we talked about the underfunded reserves. Uh, and last, but maybe the most important issue is our uh, two biggest treatment plants, the one in Academy Creek and Dunbar Creek, our wastewater treatment plants, are probably needing a great deal of uh, rehab and, and improvements. And that's important because it doesn't matter how what you do to convey it. If you've got plenty of capacity to get it there, if you can't treat it once it gets there, you don't have what you need to be able to do the job. We're not going to be able to uh, function. So we're about to take out a bond issue. You know, just FYI, the plan right now is uh, here in the next couple, three months, we're going to be looking to take out a major bond issue to try to make the upgrades at the uh, plants and, and to some of the major collection lines here in Brunswick and in the county that uh, are long overdue and that if we don't do them, we're going to have major problems down the road in, in a way that I don't think we can put off. We're at that point with, with both the plant and with those assets. Uh, in item five, I talked about, you know, again, we talked about we've got 30,000 customers. There's a master plan that has been a, a moving target of sorts, but has been uh, worked on at least four times since the once right before the commission was formed and three times, at least three times since the commission was formed. And the most recent reviews, after I've taken a look at it with staff and looked at a few other things that maybe got overlooked in, in some of the earlier, earlier reviews, we looked at it and said, okay, if we had to do everything we needed to do to rehab existing assets. And if we did the things that were indicated we needed to do to keep up with expansion of probable expansion uh, going forward in the county, the numbers you see in front of you are what we'd be facing, 83 million in uh, rehab and repair or replacement. And that's the part just to invest in what we've got that's worn out and needs help. 63 million in expansion needs, that is to provide additional capacity in areas where we think there's growth in those kind of options over the next five years. There is no way under God's green earth, that this 30,000 customer utility can provide that kind of uh, capital improvements. Not any. Not all that's going to happen. A very small fraction of that's going to happen. Although I will say, the most critical items in that list, we talked about just a minute ago, treatment plants and some of the major <coughs> trunk line collection lines on the wastewater side, we're going to address. It's, it's, it's too urgent not to. We're going to borrow money say this is it will push us to a point where we're at or near uh, the very limits of our borrowing capacity after we do that. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, at a point where other significant needs will be will be very, very challenged to, to move ahead in the next three or four years beyond this 
to do other big needs type investments. Sewer pump station and capacity status. I think one of the issues that's been big since I got here was back <coughs> in the we leave that. You said you can't do the 146 million, but how much can you do with the bond issue? And what we're what, with the bond issue, we're looking at <coughs> borrowing between the 2018 and the 2019 borrowings to get the two plants done. We're looking at it and to do those big trunk lines. I'm telling you about their and their old steel reinforced concrete pipes that are like 30 inches in diameter. They need to be replaced because the tops of those pipes have literally been eaten away by the crust of gases. We've got to upsize them to accommodate the SPLOS project that we're doing and to also to, to well, both of the SPLOS projects need some accommodation, and this is part of that. But the total uh, borrowing that I'm anticipating right now is um, right on the order of $45, $50 million over the next two and, and that's just enough to cure your critical well, problem. Fix the two plants, bring them back. So, up so to get done what needs to be done, you'll still be a hundred million dollars short. Yeah. That, that's 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 accurate. And, and one of the things that I, I'll stake here is we've gone through the budget <coughs> process this year to get ready for fiscal year 17, 18. We looked at the rates. We're increasing the rates and. Looking at the definition of what EPA says is affordability, which is 2, point, uh, two to 2.5% the water of your median income of the community. 2 to 2.5% of the median income for sewer. That's a, I don't know how EPA came up with the number of what. But we looked at the statistics of what our community, we focused in on Brunswick, which is probably the uh, lower end of things. It's got a lower median income than St. Simon Island and the rest of the county. We will be right at that, the top end of that affordability. So we've got, you know, a challenge there. We don't have room to play with rates. You know, it's the kind of thing we should have been working on these issues for years and years. But again, it's not uncommon. This is the kind of thing that's going on all over the country. Everybody's having the same discussion. Well, we got to deal with it. So we have an unsoluble problem. Well, it's a difficult problem. I'm not going to say it's every problem solved. Excuse it's me, just, I didn't mean that. Yeah, it's just, we're, we're, it's, it's a difficult, it's going to be a challenge. And I think right now, if I had to pick my biggest task in this role, is to, to solve that problem. The funding sources to make everything work, to make these things happen. But again, because again, back to item one, if we aren't functioning at a certain level, community doesn't function at, at that level. Isn't, isn't the county and the county commission somewhat responsible for trying to help you with that? They do. We're, we're in conversation with them all the time. Finding the solutions though, don't grow, it doesn't grow on trees and we're still looking for the, the, the out of the box ideas to try to make some of this work. Uh, I know we've talked about you know how we can uh, manage the tapping fees to get the <coughs> Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do about uh, the rate structure itself and how we accommodate that in light of the portability issue. But I think one of the things we've got to keep in mind is there's <coughs> bigger challenges, there's community challenge, and we need everybody to work together. Mr. Jeff, are you also looking at state programs for funding? There we're looking programs. at a lot of things. I, I know Any one of federal our grants available? There's not no. a lot of money available at the state level. I'm, I'm going to say no like here there's because all the utilities are in need and you know how tight state and federal monies are now most states are barely uh, meeting their budget in fact some of them are starting to look at things like uh, uh, taxing internet uh, downloads crazy as that sounds it's a reality in some states and several other states are looking at it so I guess when you're online you download information about something I guess they're, they're dinging if you're living in the right place. Well, back to the state and federal grant type stuff. I know Commissioner Ford has poured over some stuff. We looked at a few of these things, and I know that that may be a place where we can work with the county and the city because CDBG is an area that the federal government tends to maintain funding for no matter what else they drop. 
but it will take us working with the city and county commissions to try to work our way into those applications each year. Because we're not an entitlement of right. city or county, we'll have to be working each year to make application to try to get whatever we can in way of help out of those programs. But we're going to investigate all these grants that were brought to our attention just in case there's some that we can fit into and some that we can apply. I don't in any respect think that we're going to make a big dent in this list, but every little bit helps at this point. We're, you know, reaching in the couch cushions for coins now. Uh, let's Jim. Sir. There's only one practical solution. You don't solve 100 million without a box. Uh, that point. But you don't solve 100 million with an out of the box solution. Your borrowing will prohibit you, but it, that'll cap you. Three years from now, close. three years from now, the county will be done with the current SPLOS. The next SPLOS has to be for joint water sewer. Coincidentally, a five year, one penny SPLOS is $100 million, just so you know. Well, Excuse me, That's good. Um, Jeff. I appreciate your comments, but this is kind of just for the island planning. That's right. I know I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. If but you don't mind. I forgot I'm done. That, that, that was that was brought to my attention earlier, and I forgot. Thank you. But yeah. thank you, Jeff. Uh, back to the uh, status of where we got. I was leading into our master planning, our capital improvements plan. And as we went through it, the last iteration that was finished up back uh, last spring, uh, it became apparent from the analysis that was done on our pump stations, our sewer pump stations, that many of our pump stations were uh, basically outside their uh, operating capacities beyond where they were intended to. I'll say it that way. Uh, certainly EPA and uh, EPD and, and utilities across the country have certain standards to which they designed to and peaking factors that needed to be applied. Once applied, indicated we were under capacity on most of those stations. So it's placed a great deal of pressure on us to come back, resolve those capacity issues, and, and we're going to, in a minute here, we brought in maps of, of the various basins that we've got. We'll put those up for everybody to be able to take a look at and tell us where we've got excess capacity or available capacity to grow, where we're working on new capacity that will free up those opportunities, and where there is not sufficient capacity and not currently in an immediate uh, term plan for making those changes. Now, most of the critical bases in our uh, community and in our county uh, are being addressed or have been addressed, uh, but not all. So we'll be able to put that up. One thing I want to say about these maps before we take a look at them is we're going to be posting these online. This is a tool that you all can look at and, and have an idea. Okay, we're going to be doing a, a, a project over here in whatever area of town or whatever area of the county, you'll be able to take a look at look <coughs> based on the color coding of that area on our map online, you'll be able to determine if it's red, you know there's not enough capacity right now and there's no plans to increase capacity. So that's a that's a data point you can you can put away. If it's yellow, that means there's not enough capacity currently but there is immediate work going on to uh, generate more capacity in that basin. If it's green, there's currently uh, excess available capacity for more growth or new houses or new development can occur. So that'll be a tool that, that's going to be available, and we'll take a closer look at that here in a minute. Um, path forward, uh, one of the things that I've tried to do today is to inform each of you what our value is to this community and, and, and hope that we can uh, get everybody's support as we move forward and start looking at some of Jimmy's crazy ideas. I, want, I would hope that you know our understanding of what we're doing here 
<laughs> what, what we all expect for the benefit of our community, the quality of life here, we're all in the same sheet of music, but we gotta make sure this water and sewer utility is, is funded properly and getting things done they need to to keep things going out in the community. Uh, with that, I'm gonna swap over to the second page start going through the questions. Unless somebody else could, has everyone had a chance to look at the questions? Most of these were directed to the island. <coughs> Go ahead. I have a question before we move to the second page. Sure. Um, in, in terms of uh, obtaining squats, so that, are you like working with the local delegation to change your local app so that you can directly get SPLOS funds, which would also probably require changing the state law? I mean, that's one avenue. It, it, it's, a, it's a possibility. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to that. It might be a little simpler, in fact, to, to manage if, if we could get a direct SPLOS. Because I know one of the issues we had in uh, this last SPLOS is there was two projects that were funded for the Joint Water and Sewer Commission. And uh, we had to work pretty, pretty hard together with the county commission and their staff to uh, get all the paperwork done, to get everything done, to facilitate the transfer of funds and the, the execution of projects. So to your question, I think it would be a benefit, but uh, I'll take it any way we can get it at this point. Okay. Yeah, could you, um, you may have written the numbers down wrong. So 30,000 customers and commercial is 20 and residential no, is I said it that way, I've got it back. Okay. 20,000 residential, right. 10,000 is, is commercial industrial. So on the island, you know, I don't think we know how many people are over there, um, but a lot of people think it's somewhere between 12 and 18, depending on the season. But I know you know how many meters are there. I don't want to talk about it. And um, if we have 20 total in the county, that would say St. Simons is more than half of them. Is that right? Sounds like it. Uh, John, do you know how many meters? France SSI. Approximately right. 10,000 in total. So about half. But if you got 12,000 in population or 18,000, yeah, they're not, well, you know, it's not one per person per yeah. meter. Yeah. So that is no sense. <coughs> yeah, understood. Okay. So half half the uh, half of your customers, residential or on the island. Sounds like. It. Don't hold me to it because we can drill that down. You're pretty confident. 10,000 about? Or? That's total dealers, commercial and residential. On the island. Okay, so we'd have to refine that a little bit. Any other questions before we. None? We can go. Uh, First question that's submitted to me is how does uh, JWC view the actions of IPC in approving new developments that affect sewer and water capacity issues? And this answer probably applies to the uh, Lane County uh, Planning Commission just as much as would IPC. Uh, my feeling is we're here, we want to sustain the very best quality of uh, service we can, but ultimately, we're, we, we've got to, all we can really do is give you all the facts. How much capacity is available? You know, is, if there's not enough, are there plans for more capacity? Ultimately, we, you know, when we review a set of plans, staff here is making comments on those plans if there's a problem with capacity, and we forward it on. Now, if the plans get approved, or if you all decide to approve a particular development, you know, you're the policy makers. All we can do is provide the information. I would say that, you know, logically, you would expect that uh, if there was a, a long-term problem with capacity, none of you would ever uh, approve a development. And it probably wouldn't get to you because I don't believe that the county staff would approve it. Just FYI. All we can do is provide the facts as we know them. We're not, we're not able to really put the brakes on anything. All we can do is, is 
deal with them, let everybody know what the situation is. Actions treatment uh, per the uh, county ordinances is question A. What suggestions do you have for how IPC should consider the comments that JWC provides for making that determination? Uh, in say such as wording until such time. Well, that gets back into what I was saying before. If we've got plans on, on the on the docket to do something, uh, we can tell you at such time as we make such and such, whatever the changes are that we'll, we'll get to, that means there's at some point the development will be compliant with, with our ability to provide service. Uh, that's all I can tell you. Again, it's an effort to provide facts. It's not to say, uh, you know, we would make you or offer for you to make a commitment on a, a development that's uh, waiting on capacity that should come. Uh, one of the things we've been doing in areas where we have commitments or liabilities or perceived liabilities in some cases to provide capacity for some developments where there was none, but we were working on it. We, we've sold them taps so they could get things done, and we've uh, had them sign uh, essentially hold harmless agreements. What is hold harmless? We know there's work going on, and they're willing to take the risk of building a house or a building of some kind, a development of some kind, and, and wait for us to finish the project. They can sign the whole harmless, pay their tap fee, and get started. For timing purposes, that helps sometimes. But it, it, it doesn't commit absolutely unless we know absolutely that there is a, a finish date out there or that there is capacity well above and beyond that required for a particular development uh, that's coming. So again, it's not an absolute thing, but it, it, we do make exceptions where we've had developers or builders sign whole harmless agreements to allow them to get moving uh, on property that's been platted previously. This is not on new development. You also have, don't you have a process where you can enter an agreement with the developer where they can build the, the infrastructure required? We do. Are they all build it or they just pay for it or who builds it? Uh, the way it works is we, we've been, to, the only time we've done it so far, we've only had one successful application of what you're talking about, unsolicited proposals. We've talked to a number of developers about such things on a number of occasions since I got here, but we only had one that made it to execution. And basically what we did was we looked at what they were requiring, what they needed for their help. Uh, we signed the agreement with them. They wrote us a check, an agreed upon amount of funding for a specific modification to system assets. We've taken their check, we ordered materials, <coughs> and we're going to do the upgrades ourselves. Okay. So that, that didn't get funneled through us. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that's the way it'll work every single time, but that's the way on the one occasion it's worked so far. But that's an option for developers. It is. And it's also getting back to the expansion. You know, we were talking about the funding issues a while ago. Uh, for groups of developers or somebody that's well healed enough, uh, larger asset needs or asset needs for expansion, that maybe that's another solution that can be uh, for the folks out in the uh, development world here locally could investigate and maybe try to take advantage of. And on the tail end of our unsolicited proposals, we give these folks a chance to get payback on their uh, investment. There's other people tie on, they're getting a 70-30 split of whatever their tap fees are for that particular asset until they get their initial investment paid off. So that's a tool. But I noticed in this section, though, where you're talking about how you respond to the water and sewer capacity, you say provided funding. I mean, that's usually great out because we've already discussed 
there is no funding. And so, you know, it seems to me you ought to uh, maybe try to tie that down some about not just say, well, if we have the money, we'll do it. I mean, will you have the money in a reasonable period of time or? or it depends on the situation <coughs> yeah. and what is needed. I'll, I'll tell you right now, if somebody came to me and said, we need you to invest, we need Joint Water and Sewer Commission to invest a million bucks to do development coming up over here at Trade Winds, we don't have a million dollars. You know, if the owners of Trade Winds had a million bucks, they could walk in and we, we work the unsolicited proposal or we have to borrow money. Or we don't have it right now to do any work. I guess I'm saying is that on the planning commission, we need to as definitive as you can be and not just have outs in there, which is saying that this is not an out. What I, the way I see it, Stan, is what this is is telling you the facts. If if somebody comes in, I'm not going to, for everybody that comes in and says they want more capacity, we're not just sitting there saying, sure, whatever you need. If I've got the money, I'm going to do it for you. That's not the way it works. We're not giving everybody, and if I had conveyed that, I didn't mean to. It's more the case of we want to help the community in every way possible, but I don't know that we're going to be able to make, you know, realistically, there's no way we can meet every developer's Well, we've already needs. discussed the fact that you're $100 million short. I think the thing that you all need to rely on is when you get a set of plans, do we say, is there current capacity or is there a current project underway to generate the capacity required for that development? And not worry about whether we've got the funds or not. If we say we've got the you know, project in process, we've already identified the funds for that particular piece. I hope, I hope that well, helps. Also, I, I, one thing that if, if the developer had come to you and said that uh, he wanted to work with you and provide funds for extending the lines that you don't have the money to do, that would be some information we would like to have <clears throat> as well. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm certain we can, we can pass that along. Right. That would be part of the, okay, we have identified funding source for the, pro, for right. the, right. For the project that would have and if the commission tells the planning group that there is not capacity, what would you expect the planning commission to do with that information? If, if, if we told you there's not capacity, I mean, my expectation as a citizen would be you wouldn't let somebody uh, build not having capacity. Uh, you know, you'd have to wait till there was capacity or at least some formal project plan being executed to provide that capacity. If we say there's not capacity, but there is a project underway that will yield capacity by about six months from now, or about 12 months from now, or three years from now, then you gotta take it in, you know, developers willing to go at risk, that's up to y'all then if you wanna let him take that risk. I can give you that information, but then, you know, logically, you let those folks go ahead. With our assurances, if we say there's a project underway, or actually, in the, in the, let me give you an example. The SPLOS project right now is going to free up a lot of North Mainland capacity. The first little phase is going to carve out a little chunk, maybe six, eight months from now. But the bigger capacity is probably 18 to 24 months away. If somebody needs a lot of capacity, they need to wait on that other project. So the county folks are just going to have to take that into, a, you know, do we want to let these guys get started now and wait on the sure project to come, or do we hold them up for a while? So if the planning commission, either one of them, approves a development where there is not capacity, what kind of position does that put the county in? It violates your ordinance. What? Yeah, I'm from a legal standpoint, I don't know. I'm not sure. So basically, it should be like a go no go if you've got capacity or not, or a deferral until such time as there is capacity. I, that's again, that's a policy decision. I'm going to say I'm not opposed if we know there's capacity coming that's already in the works. That's already you know we've done that. We're doing the engineering. We're we're doing the construction. We're in some phase of making that capacity happen. 
I'm not opposed. I wouldn't be personally opposed to you guys provided the capacity plan will meet the needs of that development. And there's not already six other developments standing in line to consume all that capacity. But we wouldn't send you a, uh, an analysis like that. I would that should come in as a recommendation from the staff that recommend it be deferred until such time as capacity available or um, a, a statement of fact that plan capacity for that material is on or about this period of time. So we would have that information to, to use me, in, in a decision making process. Let me address the issue and, and, and it's I think a broader issue than what we're really talking about right now. When you all approve a developer's plan and his plan, and let's say use a residential, but he says he's going to build 400 homes. Okay. Do we have the capacity for those 400 homes today? And we say, yes, we do. And then, you know, a year down the road, he's kind of, you know, or she is not really doing much, and he's still got a promise of 400 homes. And then somebody else comes in and says, oh, I'd like to build 600 homes, and they're feeding into the same basin. Well, what do we do at that point? This guy is not really moving very fast. His project seems to be not working. This guy wants to build 600 homes, and, and he thinks that he can go, but we have 400 homes over here, and now we're gonna tell this guy, no, you can't do that. So we need, in my opinion, and this is not necessarily shared by all of my fellow commissioners, a better strategic plan in which when the developer submits, I'm going to build 400 homes, he needs to give us how he's going to do that over the years. And then he's approved in the phases that he does, so he doesn't have all 400 plats or, or lots approved for taps. And the next guy that comes in, he has to do the same thing. Now then, if we're doing our job properly, we're tracking that capacity and how much we're eating on the, on the <coughs> entire system. We'll know what the capacity of the sewer plant is. We'll know what the capacity is of the conveyance lines. And then it is up to us to resource the growth of that over a phase time. That way, water sewer is not holding and not being able to, uh, because those 400 taps, he's not gonna wanna buy the taps for those at the prices that they are. We don't necessarily wanna sell him 400 taps for the <laughs> 20 years at today's prices. Because the only way that we, as we obtain capital for expansion of the system currently is through selling taps. Splots is a way to, to get around that or to help that, but today that's what we have to do. So I think that if we take our strategic planning process and start to ask the developer more detailed questions about how he sees his development unfolding, that that would work a lot better. Uh, out uh, Frank Creek Township is huge, but they're not going to consume all those taps in the near term. We'll have plenty of capacity to meet that requirement as we see it right now with what we're doing on 2032. Uh, it also will provide the capability that we need for, uh, I think, Sinclair Plantation in the future. It's not there yet but they're putting sidewalks back down today. So we're pretty close to having 2032 done. At some point, we have to go back in and upsize the lift station 2032 to do it. And that's on the, the list of things to do. Uh, keep talking sewer, but we also have to look at water. Yeah, but you do sell taps. 
I mean, the vocal, if it came in today and said, I want 400 taps, and you got the capacity, do you sell it? If I've got the capacity, you got the yes. capacity, yeah, you yeah. sell it. Yeah, that's, that's still, but that's protected itself for the future. That's, that's, that's true, and that's something that, that we need to relook that for policy right now because we really don't want to sell all the capacity at today's price. Right. Well, today's prices. That, that doesn't tie it all up, period. Because, to yeah. what Commissioner Elliott's saying, you, you get these folks that buy up mass quantities. Man, when they poured up all the capacity, they're doing buying enough for the next 20 years of their business, 10 years of their business. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of one of those uh, what's best for the community kind of thing. That's something that, that your commission has to has to wrestle with. That's not nice another yeah. No, yeah, that's not. Say so and, and and another point on the taps. Um, <coughs> When you buy a tax, assuming that you buy all 400, then you start having to pay the administrative and debt service fee that goes along with that. Okay? When we do the borrowing that we're going to think we're going to do, then that will go on the debt service fee. Now, to the rate payers, what will happen is we will reduce the amount that's on the, the, the rate that they put in for what's called R&R, &R, Restore and Renew. So that the burden on them when they pick up the additional uh, requirement on the REU side of it won't be as great. But that developer that's got all those taps and is paid for it is going to be paying into the Water Sewer Commission that administrative charge and the debt service charge. So they're going to have to do some cost-benefit analysis that they're going to have to, to look at is that how many caps they want to buy, and that's under the current policy. And we may have to look at the policy and see if that needs to stay. It's tricky. So, you, so you're actually talking about altering your first-come, first-served policy, right? Looking at that, because the 400 person home person would be the first come to say I want 400. So you're really well I'm saying it puts us in a, a very bad situation <coughs> because he's not let's assume that you approve a 400 lot area and he doesn't buy all those right. taps right. okay then if he doesn't buy all those taps then those taps are available and that's how we got into the situation to begin with we weren't really tracking capacity well enough so that we knew when to say hold up okay. until you know well, I wouldn't say stop you know um, so the, the developer his problem is well do I buy all 400 caps to guarantee that I have it and what we instituted last year was such that you can buy all 400 caps but you're going to pay for those every month in, in paying us part of the bill. Okay, as that grows, the developer may have some, some issues with that. And if we ever go to a, uh, like a lot of utilities are going to now, where you have a base level of service that you buy, so that you, uh, I don't want, the number I don't want to say, but you have a certain number of gallons that you pay for every month, and that's your water bill. And as long as you stay within the that is a, fat, a, a fixed fee, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We ever move to that, then that would be another added charge on the developer that has bought all 400 taps. It's going to have to pick up. Could you sell taps and say that they have to be utilized or hooked onto with an X period of time from the day of sale? We have discussed well, that's that. That's not a bad idea. You know that we we in fact we started off that way. Did we? Or charge your penalty after Dallas. No, it's it's it becomes a problem for us. We'll look at that again. I don't think that's a bad idea at all. So it was it was noted by you all that the, the planning commissions make a policy decision, yeah. and uh, I'm aware. I think we're all all aware that you all have been concerned about certain decisions that you can't make because of the consent order and the concern about the federal um, penalties and so forth for that. 
so here's my question. The county considers the planning commission members to be county employees. If the planning, so do the county, do the planning commissions have any liability if we approve a new development that has, if no capacity exists? I will. I'm going to say, I have an opinion about that, but we have an attorney in the room. Uh, and I will answer that question offline. <laughs> I think this is very helpful because I think you know we're all we're all trying to represent my the public of the county here, and we, and we have our different hats on. And this is an excellent forum to bring some of these questions forward. I think I think that uh, you know if everything that's been being asked for the last two or three years. Not, not just liability, but how do you deal with uh, an application if everything if everything else looks okay to Ed and he wants to approve it, but there's a question about capacity, we don't want to sue him, right? And I think that's really the part of the question. Um, I'm not sure how that's supposed to work right now, but I'll tell you how I would like to see it work, okay? Uh, especially when you throw out the question of liability. I'd like to see if we're, and, and if Will has listened to me so he can look at it. Uh, I'd like to see it work where, say all requirements are met. You know, if y'all have to put a statement to your decision, all requirements are met except joint water sewer. Uh, we have issues with joint water sewer, capacity, sewer, whether it's water or both, uh, and that we have a statement here from Joe Water Sewer, what those issues are, and they would have to be dealt with. So, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, or to paraphrase, you're saying yeah. approval contingent upon? Yeah, approval, yeah, it, it has to be, it has to be a way to kind of, kind of help us, help us work to a point where the Island Planning Commission and the Mainland Planning Commission has done everything they could do, and these things are outside of your responsibility because oh, over here where I'm sitting now, boy, I, our, our responsibility is to provide water and sewer and maintain those systems to do that, and it's not getting in county policy. Uh, you know, it's not to give you all direction, okay? We can, we can tell you what the status is of the system for a particular applicant that's coming up. You know, where that is geographically in the system, where that is in the system. Uh, we can handle that. If we can't handle that, I think we can we can be very clear about that because one thing that you for the sewer, the people, I'm, I've only been here a few months, but the folks that have been here for a little while, I believe they know the shape of the system. Just I mean, one end of the county to the other, they have, they have looked at this system. Uh, too many people were looking the other way, way too many years, uh, just hoping it would all work somehow without putting any more money into it. Uh, but, but that's all been turned around. And, uh, I think I think North Water Sewer really, I mean, that, that, as, as far as inventory of that system and understanding the shape of that system, uh, throughout the island, throughout the mainland. I believe they know that as well as they can. Uh, as they identify, and look, we just had some pictures last week uh, where there's some cameras run down into some silver to go to the mainland, and uh, we, we've learned uh, what we know is a bad system is really worse than we thought. <laughs> okay. That's the pipe I was talking about. That's the pipe you was talking about. But we're not... We don't have our head, head, heads in the sand. We're trying to identify uh, where all the issues are because it's very important to Glen County uh, that we do that uh, to deliver the service we have to deliver for many, many years to come. Uh, and, and, and I want to talk about the dollars here real quick. Uh, Mr. Kilgore brought up, uh, and I'm glad he did, about the SPOS, but when we're talking about money, and, and, and uh, the director here mentioned, you know, we don't know where the money will come from. Well, I have uh, mentioned the same thing to my fellow commission members here about spot funding. 
uh, that is a very, there's a very good chance uh, that that could, you know, a little over three years from now, you know, if this community is willing and supportive of it, uh, you know, there's a potential $100 million in the next boss. And would it all go to North Horn and Silver? I have no idea. Uh, I would pitch for at least some of it to go. Uh, but the biggest question about that money in the next blast is will the community support it? Uh, you know, we've got to have strong community support to even get there. So just keep that in mind. I'll learn to talk about it. One of the other things I think uh, we could look at in terms of funding, I'm getting off track, but I just want to cover this while it's on my mind. You know, with uh, the Navy uh, went into Cameron County, the <coughs> federal government paid impact funds, local impact funds, and local government. They built libraries, fire stations, schools, a little bit of everything. Joe Porter Sewer has taken over the water and sewer system out of Flitzy. Uh, it's got the same shape as all of the water and sewer system outside of Lexi before JWC took it over. Uh, I feel like that there's a there's room to go to the federal government to use this after the fact and ask for impact money to local governments. Uh, try to take that thing over and bring it up to speed. And while you're listening to me, yeah, there's another headache that we have. Uh, but I feel like there's a big case to be made to the federal government to get local impact, local, local, local community impact grants. And that could be substantial money if we could invest in that. Uh, we're going to work on that. But I go back to Ed's question. Um, as far as liability, it may be the best thing that uh, look at look and see if we can put uh, statements that qualify. Uh, IPC and NPC's uh, approval. And if you can get there where you can approve an applicant, an application, everything except for questions about water and sewer, you know, put a statement of qualification that this has got to be, uh, you know, we, we can approve this, but uh, the building permit should not be allowed by the county unless, unless joint water sewer is satisfied they can they can provide a tie So that's my thoughts on it. Well, Jimmy, um, I know you had this struggling issue of a number of customer you know, rate payers and your addressable rate payers. And there's this uh, concern about giving water service if you don't get sewer service. And, and I've heard this. And, uh, I'm more concerned the other way around, but keep going. <laughs> Yeah, Folks get sewer service now. Have you considered Mine. have you considered embracing uh, or not being everything to everybody? I mean, you can't serve the whole county. That, that ain't happening. No. And, and we're a little so bit. so. Why not embrace new technologies like these uh, uh, sewage uh, septic systems in a box? All right. On site treatment. On site for small residential homes, home sites. I mean, these things have 95% um, treatment rates. As far as I'm concerned, that's not a decision here. Uh, the way the ordinance is read, as I recall it, if you're within 500 feet <coughs> of sewer assets, you yeah. tie on. Right. Unless there's some, I got across several right. other property owners, that kind of thing, or unless there's no capacity. Twice written variances for folks that told them I'll write you a variance because there is not capacity for you to tie on, even though you're within 500 feet. And I left it to them to work out the details with the county, um, county, this, the Georgia Health, Health. Part, Department of Health, uh, as to whether they could comply with some other system they would approve. Uh, so I'm not holding that kind of a issue up. If somebody has that and want to bring it to the table, uh, as long as we're in agreement, that's their alternatives. 
I'll, I'll help him out on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Gene asked a question. Gene, you asked a question a while ago. Uh, before I forgot about it, you were in the comment section. If we say there's no plans, I mean, excuse me, there's no capacity and there's no plans, take it to the bank. If, if we say there's no capacity, but there are current plans for capacity that would accommodate this development by some day, maybe if we know at that point in time on a particular situation, <clears throat> that's going to be in here. So if you guys are getting that in essence. I think we've done a lot of communication with planning folks at the county and uh, Pam Thompson. We've done a lot of coordination to make sure we're communicating the right information so you all have what you need. If you don't get that, or if you think there's something the way we're communicating, when you see a set of plans, give us a call. We, we just need to make sure we're all on the same sheet of music. We want to get you what you need. Okay. It's basically a no-go-go with A, B, C, and D options. You know, you have capacity, so that gives us the opportunity to approve if all other things are equal. You don't have capacity, but it's planned within 12 months, or some period. whatever. <laughs> There's uh, there is capacity. You know, there, there's some some caveats there, and if we have that data, then that would give us an opportunity. If somebody's doing a presentation that's going to take a year and a half to do, then we might feel more compelled to approve it. Yeah. But if and, they're and that's what we're trying to five do. years down the road, then why give them an opportunity to or an option to build something? Now. Yeah. The no another one was to put on their. Uh, option is that we're in negotiations with the developers as we talked earlier for them to do we could do that but I wouldn't hang my hat on making a decision over negotiations because negotiations are uh, unpredictable. Well, we've had in our meeting where a developer has agreed in the meeting to do the upgrade. Yeah. They yeah. have a letter signed by us. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's what you really need. Right. We've already made an agreement that he will do uh, Whatever they need. That's right. right. And, and we work that out. Make a quick comment that's about what Mike said. Plan and there's right. Make a quick comment about what Mike said about SPOST. From a voter's perspective, you've got to look at numbers. If you've got 30,000 customers, we've got 80,000 voters. Don't take rocket science. Figure that there's 50,000 folks out there who are going to not be in favor of paying well, the cost. The accounts don't measure up to the number of voters, but uh, I will say this. One of the, one of the jobs I've got and I would emphasize to the staff here, is we've got to convince those non-ratepayers that there is value in supporting this utility in those kind of out-of-the-box manners. If they understand we can't provide the uh, uh, capacity because of new developments going in and the houses can't get built, it means jobs, it means tax revenues, that means the county can't provide the basic services they provide in the way of police protection, fire protection, storm drainage, planning, whatever else. The county does a plethora of things. Everybody, whether you're buying water and sewer from us or not, benefits from it. And therefore, they need to be, we've got to educate folks on what's going on and why it is important that they support whatever we do, even if they don't have skin in the game every month when it's bill time. Gary, you keep raising your hand, will you? Well, I was going to say maybe it sounds like uh, that developer needs to uh, uh, either get a recommendation from the county staff or his development team to come to JWSC first before they start really grinding on uh, a development. Awesome. Some, some of them do. In fact, we've been talking about charging a meeting fee for folks. <laughs> <laughs> they're on our door a lot. Uh, developers, but a lot of times their engineers are in the very early phases of a piece of property before it gets going. They'll come and, and talk to us about capacity. Not all, but there is some of that that goes on. Yeah, I want to say something to Gene about the just brought up about politics. You're talking about politics. <laughs> Folks that don't have board and sewer and don't want to pay, and those that do have, but uh, when we were in the uh, one of our discussions over at the Board of Commissioners uh, about trying to put together a SPOS to get it passed. Uh, we first talked about, and it might have been Commissioner Brunson had thrown out uh, 
$25 million for don't worry sword, but that just, I could tell it didn't get a whole lot of uh, good vibes from the fellow commissioners. Let me correct that. I said give them all of it. <laughs> that didn't, that yeah. didn't go yeah. any, anywhere. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah. so uh, but, but I think this is instructive for everybody here uh, when we talk about the next clause because, uh, but anyhow, at some point I just realized it was not, and I felt like, you know, we've got to do something. We, we've got to do something to help the NWC. And uh, so I threw out a $15 million figure. That was stuff. Uh, don't ask me how $15 million, anyhow, it's stuff. Now, folks are out there voting on it. Uh, I represent District 1. There's probably less water and sewer in District 1 than any other district. Uh, I proposed $15 million. I supported helping. AWC. Uh, the only district that did not vote as a district for, for spots, district one, <laughs> by district. And I'd do it again. You know, three years from now, three and a half years from now, I'd do it again because uh, it is going to take uh, funding <coughs> every source we can get funding from to get ahead of the curve. AWC was really handed a, uh, I, I, I don't think you could have run something in the ground worse than what it has been run to the ground in county. And with the debt to go with it, kind of, you know, if you've got a brand new car out there in the driveway and you're making $400 a month payments on it, that's one thing. But when it's everything on it is broke, and you make a four hundred dollar month payments on it, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. And you look at every day how can you get a new car to get over this old broke one? That's what we are. And, uh, but uh, things are falling into place. We're going to get there. Uh, can we tell you where the money's going to come from? No, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, but uh, splotched, uh, splotched for three and a half years. <coughs> really needed to support uh, and it's not JWSC and what JW where JWSC sits in the scheme of things in Lake County uh, it's got to be a part of it and if it's not funded properly uh, we're going we're gonna to be sitting here talking about the same things over and over we've got to move yet beyond it so one of, one of the things is for sure, and, and to uh, Commissioner Browning's point, is that there are a lot of liabilities out there in the ground right now for us, and I, I know that uh, we're catching the worst of it, but, you know, I, my fear is there'll come a time when we can't, we can't do enough to manage it all. The band-aids are going to get real expensive, and everybody here knows the old commercial, pay me now or pay me later. Well, at the point we're letting these things eventually start to happen on, on a routine basis and we're, we're having to catch behind and do emergency repairs and those kind of things. It's the payment later is a pretty expensive uh, uh, price. Uh, Marissa, you want to ask a question? I was curious about the liability issue um, for the planning commissions. Should we require every person to do a hold harbor? No, no, this is, uh, the whole harmless was meant for folks that uh, were anxious to get started and the assets weren't necessarily in place just yet. <coughs> and you know, you never, when you're working on a project, everybody in here that's ever had anything to do with construction knows things happen. Materials don't show up that you expect, the rain doesn't cooperate, the, kind, the right guy that has the skills to do something didn't make it even though he said for sure for the last five days in a row he was going to be out there. Everybody knows it. Those same kind of things happen. Even though we lay out a plan for a developer and say, okay, it's going to be six months, they have to sign that whole harmless just in case the things that are out of our control. But if there's already sewer there or already water there, you know, to meet their needs, there's no need for everybody to sign in that whole harmless. Right. But if there's if any, anything comes before us and it says, there is no capacity or there will be capacity, that, that person should have a 
Yeah. Well, because if it's not capacity by that date, are they going to hold us responsible for that? I'm not sure. Capacity. That. I'm well, sorry. I didn't go ahead. Um, so this kind of ties in with what uh, Commissioner Brown was saying earlier, and I think the question that came up over here um, about the uh, unsolicited proposals. Um, Pam couldn't be here today because she's in training, um, and I don't want to speak for her necessarily, but I believe that her policy going forward will be that if there's a, something that comes before the one of the planning commissions, unless she gets a statement from the JWC that either capacity is available or currently available, or capacity will be, there's a project currently underway that will provide capacity within X amount of time, that she will not forward that to the planning commissions. If it's a, well, we have an agreement in principle to do an unsolicited proposal, uh, then those will not be forwarded to y'all until we get something from the planning commission that says, I mean, I'm sorry, from the JWC that says there's capacity or there soon will be. So that should address a lot of that. So you should not be getting applications in front of you where it says there's no capacity. <coughs> or, well, we think we've got something worked out. We've already gotten something that says. We have in the past, yes. yes. And and I think Pam is trying to address that with a new policy. Um, I think Pam has said she, she's not going to see anything in the plant conditions that's not compliant. Right. All the different items in court, including the um, And we have in the past uh, to, to your point, uh, Commissioner Browning, uh, there were some instances where, say, a preliminary plaque came forward and there wasn't a specific plan in place at that time for capacity, and the planning commission approved it subject to <coughs> a statement on the preliminary plat basically saying there's not capacity now, capacity is not guaranteed, and they won't get construction plans until such time as capacity uh, is available. Um, right. And so, um, but again, I think. Pam is formulating a new policy to try to head those things off and keep that from coming before them. And she can provide more details about that when she gets back. Uh, one of the items that, one of the questions that came up, if we move along just for a second, we talked about the capacity on the island uh, at the Dunbar Creek, and there was a question of uh, the, the JMC has expressed concern about sewage treatment system uh, being near capacity from that perspective. How should IPC consider new development proposals that require hookups if capacity is not available? Okay. Basically, we're not going to send anything to anybody uh, that says there's capacity if there's not capacity. And the first test is, is there treatment capacity? So that's not going to happen. Um, what I have done today is tried to put together a status of what's going on at Dunbar Creek. Where we're at in the, in the realm of things for that particular facility. And as you look at it, the plants, okay, look at that top table. The plants permitted at 4 million gallons per day. Uh, the current permitted REUs or REUs that are being consumed by businesses or residential folks, or folks that are out there using capacity, is 13,333 uh, approximately. And I, and I, Oh, excuse me, that's the total for four, four million. I'm sorry, got, got ahead of myself. Okay. How many know how to calculate an RAU? What is an RAU? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Residential <laughs> equivalency <laughs> unit. That's right. That's right. No, it's, 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 it's what the engineering standards say is the approximate amount for a typical residential home would consume in a day's, day's time. I guess that's with 2.76 people living in the house. I don't know how they come up with it. But 300 gallons a day per household is considered an REU. You know, you can argue with the changes in fixtures and things, that ought to be more or ought to be less. But, you know, right now that's the standard by which everybody's hanging their hats. Thank you for stopping me on that. Okay, I'm going to drive it a little bit more. That's, that's a residential unit. 
if you're looking at somebody that wants to build a hotel or wants to build a restaurant, you need to be able to understand what the REU calculation is for that restaurant or that hotel is because it differs on the capacity and, and that's how it will help you keep track of the capacity issues. And we keep to try, to try to keep it simple just by REUs and, and that way you can understand the capacity better. But, but having said, thank you, Mr. Uh, but having said that, four million gallons a day equates to about 13,333 of these REUs. If everybody was using <laughs> Currently, uh, sorry for the misspelling there, I didn't catch that until just a second, but the current monthly daily average out at Dunbar is 2.5 million actual flow going into the plant. And that equates to 8,333. Uh, the number of REUs at 80% of capacity is 10,000. 667 if you're if you're using 80 percent of your capacity why don't i bring up 80 percent because 80 percent mark is the point at which uh epa says you need to be starting on your design for the next uh increase in capacity you don't wait till you're right at 100 percent you start at 20 percent and start doing your design and making your doing the analysis getting ready to construct it so that when you before you hit 100% of capacity, you've already constructed the new capacity. You're never in a situation where you're without or have to shut somebody down. I'm saying that. So at 80%, 10,667 taps will have been issued approximately. Uh, so the current availability of taps between now and the time we hit 80% on Dunbar would be 2,333. If we went all the way to build out max capacity of 4 million gallons a day without adding capacity, it would yield at 100% capacity, we got 5,000 more caps left to work out of capacity. So that gives you an idea. If on the island, I know community-wide, we sold uh, a little over 600 REUs this past year. And I, don't, I apologize, I don't know what fraction I went to the island and what percentage I stayed on this side of the causeway. But let's just say it's 200. If 200 or 250 uh, uh, were to be going, you're talking about somewhere on the order of 8 to 10 years before uh, you hit the 80% mark, right? Am I doing my math right? So uh, you're saying these equate to a tap by right. 2,300? Yeah. yeah. So uh, and tap, and, and uh, you know, I know some of the houses over there are really big, <coughs> six bathrooms and things like that. So it can wind up having two taps per household. But in general, uh, there's still a lot of capacity. We've got time to get ready. Yeah. Mr. Chunk, in that uh, I presume things don't flow evenly every day. No, no. And that you got rain water and storm water and, and, and uh, you know, at what point, I mean, at, uh, is 80% capacity allow you to accommodate those uh, special occasions? It does. And, and one of the things I was going to, that next table we were about to talk about. Sorry. You're, no, that's what, I'm glad you brought it up. It's a good time. You kept me moving along. But basically, one of the things, discussions that I've had with staff, my staff tells me in the past when we've asked about uh, that next permit to get additional capacity, if we do the physical changes, improve the pots and pans to get more, more capacity out of that plant, the DNR, EPD, they're basically telling us, you got to get your I and I issue improved. For those of you who don't know what, what I and I is, I and I is uh, rainwater uh, inflow and groundwater uh, groundwater infiltration. It's water that gets in the system because of defects in the system. It's not supposed to be there. Rainwater or groundwater. 
You don't want those going in with your sanitary sewer because the capacity in that pipe is only meant for sanitary sewer. We have an excessive problem with uh, I and I on the island. Again, it's common to a lot of old <coughs> utility systems, sewer systems, as the utilities wear out, as the laterals from the buildings and homes uh, deteriorate, they allow the water to get into the uh, system that shouldn't. And certainly the old technologies that were put in 40, 50, 60 years ago and longer, those technologies weren't the best to keep in, uh, those kind of issues at bay, uh, at bay anyway. And at this point, if you look at the numbers there, uh, what I've got on here in that table, it talks about for a normal treatment plant, the concentration of biological oxygen demand, the nutrients that come in in sewage, somewhere on the order of about 300 milligrams per liter. For Dunbar Creek, on a normal uh, day or normal normal month, we would be seeing about 140 milligrams per liter. A lot less. Why is it so much less? It's the same amount of stuff coming to the plant, but it's being diluted by the I and I that's getting into our systems out there. And that last that last box that talks about the percent I and I of the daily average flow. This is back to your question, Stan. The fact is, on average, we're about 55% of the water coming in that plant is groundwater or rainwater, I and I. We've got to talk to the state folks before we make it the next uh, permit increase and decide what improvements they want. We're going to propose that they use this kind of as a benchmark. You know, when you see that concentration start to climb before it's supposed to be, then that means we've done something in the system to drive some of that inflow and infiltration I was talking about. But this is basically taking into account the problems you're talking about. And yes, 80% gives you a little bit of swag, so it's another reason to start early and get started on those things so that you're ahead of the curve and don't get out there too close to your limbs. It's another reason to protect the trees, too. Very good point. We absorb a lot of water. Uh, less paid. On your 2,333 at the top, yep. can you help us out? How does that relate to the 5,000 plus lots that have already been approved for development? Uh, maybe it's time to pull out our, our new camper statistics. Is this yes. That's vacant. I'll put it up on the screens too. Okay. Would now be a good time to take a five minute break? Sure. I want to take a break. Technical enforcement. Set up our screen. Okay, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. It is possible. I'm going to let uh, Todd Klein, uh, Todd's our uh, engineering director here, talk a little bit about what what he and his staff have pulled together. And, uh, he tells me that this was a brainchild of, is this Pam's brainchild? We're working with Pam's staff real closely on developing these. Um, it's a Todd Klein, senior engineer, uh, General Warner Service Commission. Uh, I'm in charge of leading the planning and construction division within General Warner Service, which, through which all plans come through for um, our remarks and notation. That we then forward back to the county staff, the different uh, planning commissions. So it, it's a little difficult to see. We understand. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a zoom in digitally here. Everybody has visual access to um, the things on the wall. Just overall, what is this map? A lot of discussion on capacities, and we're only talking about conveyance, wastewater conveyance capacities at the moment. Pump stations, pump stations, unfortunately. So what is this map here? Uh, we try to keep it as simple as possible and as visual as possible so everybody can understand, the folks that need to know can understand, uh, general public uh, can understand what it means. Red, green, yellow, three colors. Red is a basin that's currently over-designed capacity and it's currently status where we're saying nobody can tie on. 
Yellow is essentially the same, but with a planned or scheduled upgrade to happen with, upon which we expect to see capacity come back again. And then green is everything's at the moment uh, sufficient to receive new connections. So what we've done, if everybody understands what a sewer basin is, sewer basin uh, essentially is the area with, with, from around which it all drains to a single pump station. So uh, via gravity collection system. So there's multiple uh, basins. This map you see before you is St. Simon's Island. Uh, there's multiple basins, multiple pump stations throughout our whole system, about 160 pump stations on the island, roughly what Kirk about half that. Uh, so a large number of basins. Uh, you can look down the kind of neighborhoods, but sometimes the uh, basins don't follow the neighborhood or uh, boundaries, et cetera. They cross lines and whatnot. What this map can do is somebody can say, okay, I've got a lot. They can come to the map, look at it, see where they fall, if they're in a red, green, or yellow basin. Um, this map right here is real basic information to begin with, just simple colors, red, green, yellow. We don't add any flow numbers. We don't add any how much capacity is available, anything like that. Internally, we have that information, but we're, we're skipping a lot of that, uh, not boring you with that info right now. Also, something you'll see on this map, I'll zoom in, we'll kind of tour around, I'll show you examples of uh, red, green, and yellow. Uh, also, the bottom corner, I'm using my pointer here, hopefully that shows, you see some information. This is what we're working with, uh, Glen County Community Development, with Pam's team. Uh, our questions to ourselves is, what is our current liability? In other words, what, what's out there, hanging out there, somebody can come in tomorrow, apply for a building permit, and then uh, tap onto our system. And so we asked for what is the, uh, what's the tally of the final platted lots? For somebody to pull a building permit, they have to be in possession of the final platted lot. The lot has to exist. There's a lot that happens to happen uh, before then if they don't, if it's not a final platted lot. Uh, Pam's team provided us with this information here. I'll try to zoom in. Maybe. Control plus. Yeah, I'll do a little school huh. style here. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I had a hand I can use to pan around. Okay. And let's see here. <coughs> okay, what we did, we broke it down into red lots, yellow lots, a table of yellow lots, and then a table of green lots, and how many vacant final platter lots exist within each basin. So a four-digit number you see here, the, the 2,000. Everything on St. Simons begins with a two, a 2,000. Everything on North Mainland begins with a four, 4,000. Everything on South Mainland, that's a 29 area, is a three, 3,000. So that's what the numbers mean. That's simply, uh, if we're looking at the greens here, 2001, two designates St. Simons Island, and one designates Pump Station One. Uh, sort of, not necessarily, but the lower the number, the closer to the plant, the way it doesn't not a one for one, but it gives you an idea. As the system has expanded, the numbers you go up and up and up numbers, so you can kind of give you an idea of reference, how close the plan it lies, or directly, um, systematically it lies. So, 2001, how many vacant lots are in that basin? Right now, from Glen County's info, we're seeing 60. Uh, you know, you can, I'll let you peruse these. Oh, by the way, these are sort of hot off the press, sort of hot off the approval from Mr. Junkin. We're going to be posting these to the website for public information as well. So it's a lot easier to get on there and zoom in than it is. To, but after the meeting, we can definitely look at the hard copies and talk about them. Uh, red basins. So if we go back up here to the red section, well, St. Simons, we've got one, two, three, four, five basins that are hard red. In other words, uh, we would not allow a tie in to those basins or within those basins at the moment. Uh, and there is no schedule. Uh, time to upgrade those stations. Okay, so you see a couple here. 2012, where is that basin? Um, and let's of course it's backwards. 2012, we show you an example of, appears bad, but 2012, let's see where that guy is. 2012 is right here, okay? It's in Sea Palms area. Well, that basin is essentially built out anyway, so there's no anticipated new taps being needed unless somebody were to subdivide an existing parcel. That's a possibility. It happens in a lot of neighborhoods. Um, but at the moment, we don't anticipate 
you know, there's zero lots available, bare empty lots. We don't anticipate any new connections happening in there. Now, if the base is red, uh, where do we go from there? Okay, you'll notice the yellows. What do the yellows mean? It means there's a schedule in place. I'll go up here, upper left hand corner. So let's say uh, 2002, that's a good example. 2002 basin, all right, it's also, uh, what are the basins does 2002 affect? What are the basins are upstream from 2002? Since 2002 is red, those basins are also red at the moment because they must flow through 2002. Uh, 2064 and 2018. If it's yellow, we create a table saying what other basins are affected by that basin, and then we put the expected uh, upgrade completion. In this case, September 8, 2017, that relates to um, our first successful unsolicited proposal that was executed. All right, pumps and equipment have been ordered. They're on the way. We expect that upgrade to happen within, you know, by September 8th. And we're going to be, believe us, pretty conservative on that number there. Um, Excuse me, Matt, you were understanding that this is the one that has paid for their own upgrade? Correct. Yes, sir. Correct. And that's Frederick, is that right? Uh, <laughs> this would be a, a certain hotel development that uh, in the 2002 basin around Ocean Boulevard. So, this is, I think you know this along. Mm -hmm. Oh, but that's not the map. He's up there. Correct. No, he, he's talking about something. Right. That's so down that here on Ocean Boulevard. Yeah. Correct. 2002 is on the south end of the island. We know where that is. Well, I, I thought that he said that before he was pointing me before up Frederick was the one that it was Frederick. <laughs> that, that that was the one that they had paid for their own improvements, and that, so it's just misunderstanding. The which one we look at? So one of girls, yeah. So sea palms, is that the one you're talking about before? Uh, it, it's, it's not important. Okay. Got, got, got. Happy to <coughs> please help me clarify. Me. So 2002 <coughs> basin, we do have an executed uh, unsolicited proposal that's in hand. We can give you an uh, anticipated schedule for upgrade. When that upgrade happens, we expect a, a nice amount of capacity to be brought up. We're not nailing it down until we get the pumps installed, we run it, run our flow downs, uh, draw down tests, then we can determine what our available capacity is at that point for any uh, other connections coming on. Does that include stormwater? Uh, everything coming to the station at present. So that includes I&I, &I, that includes, yes. So we're just strictly looking at what can the system pump and move, how much water can it move in the condition it's in right now. With no holes plugged or different things like that. So, the more holes we plug, the more capacity we free up for for use. Correct. Let me make sure I understand. We don't have the stormwater. Right. Okay. Right. I just said I just didn't that agree. Nothing intentional. The, you know. Yeah, I understand. That. Nothing intentional, but uh, Chairman Elliott's got a favorite story he likes to tell about in 2002's basin. Where I'll let you tell that story real quick. Oh, you're uh, when the, when when the tide came in, it all went to the plant. Yeah. <laughs> So we got that fixed. Go ahead, Kirk. Yeah, to clarify, uh, Todd is correct in stating that the drawdowns, when we do the drawdowns, that everything gets passed through the fuel station. When we do the calculations, uh, the reason they're not posted is because it's a moving target. Every day somebody's coming in for attack. Uh, when we do the calculations, it's strictly dependent on REU counts and those standardized format, so it does not include them. Yeah. Correct. Thanks, Kirk. For the yeah. So absolutely. So we're going to population numbers based straight out of the master plan, and that's from house counts. That's you know we're, those are uh, Glen County's traffic area studies in the past and whatnot. So that's where that information to determine the capacity of, or the needed capacity of that station, that base gets. So it does not include stormwater. Right. Thanks, Kirk. So. Uh, that's an example of what a yellow basin is, a 2002 upgrade in process, uh, hence we turn that guy yellow. And let's see if there's anything else really of, uh, okay, this is another interesting table here. Again, information from Glen County as far as lot counts, uh, total numbers in our green basins, uh, and these are buildable lots, final plat of build, buildable lots, red basins, you know, we also include a private, so are they on septic? Are they currently served? If they're not served by water and sewer, or sewer in this case, we're focused on. 
they would have to do a septic tank. There's currently 198, according to Glen County, 198 lots uh, available that could submit for a building permit tomorrow. Uh, and then lots beyond the service areas, 303. So, uh, total, the number we have at hand right now, 2004, so a little over 2,000 buildable lots on St. Simons as it stands right now. Now, keep in mind, a lot, that could be a half acre residential, that could be a 10 acre parcel. So these are lot counts. What's the next iteration of these maps? <coughs> we'll the county to go to this next level, zoning. How do we incorporate the zoning in here? Uh, obviously, a, uh, it's been talked about, we, we grade everything, we measure everything in REUs, try to get everything on the same map with that. Uh, REU is just a residence equivalent unit, 300 gallons per day. Uh, a restaurant will use many more REUs than a single family residence. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. When you say um, lock out, does that break out condos? Uh, so it'd be like, for instance, on the Marshall Building, uh, it has, let's say, 12 residential units. Uh, is that counting just one, or is that counting 12? Good question. And that's what we're talking about right now. That's the next step okay. of this map right here. This is only saying uh, the individual thing. parcels. Okay. That parcel could be zoned commercial. That parcel could be zone multifamily. It could be much more than one REU. So don't think of this as there's only a liability hanging out there of 2004 REUs. There's or 2004 single family residentials. A portion of that, we're working on determining this, a portion of that is obviously commercial, is obviously multifamily, et cetera. And don't forget those lots in some cases can be subdivided. Again, you can't see one lot turning into four. You, you know, uh, we see that all the time. So, next step above that, okay, commercial, uh, multifamily, whatever it is, what's the worst case scenario we can see? This is where we try to get into planning or projecting uh, to see what our system needs to be able to do. Uh, you know, 10 acre parcel, you know, is that uh, if it gets zoned appropriately and uh, preliminary platted for 100 lots, is that 10, acre, 10 lots a year for 10 years? Is that you know, five lots a year for 20 years. We don't know. Uh, we can make best guesses working with the county. We're going to try to do that, but we're going to depend on the county to help us out with the trends to see what our projected needs are going to be, depending on what parcels and how they're zoned um, and what existing preliminary flats are still valid exist out there. So I know they understand they have a lifespan on them as well. So there's a lot of moving parts in this thing. It's really should be looked at more of a model. Uh, a dynamic model than a static thing by any means. It's really hard to hit a button and compute and there you go. It's a lot of moving parts to it. Um, so just to kind of that kind of, and of course we uh, we don't just serve the island, we also serve the rest of Glen County. So North Mainland, uh, we'll do a little tour real quickly on it. There's uh, City Brunswick area on the south North Mainland. You see a lot of or several Red basins in here. You see some green ones too, but you do see some red ones. So we do have some capacity issues there that we have to uh, inform the, the county and the city during the review process. And you'll also see uh, yellow basins in here. So these yellow basins coming down to 4005 uh, and then upstream from 4005 are part of the uh, initial 4048 force main reroute. It's a project that bids, actually, we see bids tomorrow on that. Uh, it's the first step in the first four phases, or the four phases of squats. So the next step beyond that, we have an RFQ out for uh, the first phase of squats. It'll be a design build. But those projects are going to uh, help these yellow basins as we go north. Go around the back side of Fletzy, and if I can get the next map. Uh, continue traveling up around the airport area and serve Harry Driggers Boulevard, 99, and then up to the north. and western side of uh, uh, square 25, all those subdivisions uh, that would like to be able to build at this moment but currently can't because of capacity issues. So that's why we're showing them as yellow because we have a scheduled plan uh, definitely for 4048's reroute and phase one is lost and then we assumed I think it was a two to three year completion uh, of all <coughs> 
So that's why those bases are now yellow. But you still do see some red bases that currently we don't have a solid plan for. Now, what do you do with the red? Or let's talk about South Mainland too. So South Mainland doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but there are red basins in South Mainland that are affecting some uh, uh, projects in that area. Uh, South Port area, as well as 17 South, and then Adel Buck Swamp Road in the peninsula. So, now what do you do if there's a red basin? Uh, and we don't have, currently have a plan on the books to complete that. It may be called out in the master plan, but if we don't have a schedule, uh, you know, within the next five years or so, if we don't have a scheduled plan for improvement internal, if there's an interest, that's where we get in the unsolicited proposals we talked about. That's where uh, a developer or a, uh, someone with a project can come to us and see exactly what the, the issue is. If it's a pump upgrade in a pump station or it's an increase in the force main size or something like that, perhaps we can work together with them in an unsolicited proposal fashion to make those improvements ahead of any schedule that we may have to the needed there. That's pretty much my still. Um, we covered okay, all match. I know these are hard to see from where you sit. We can talk about them afterwards, and I can uh, answer any questions to your call. These y'all are, you have draft on these, but you're, you said you're going to put them out on the web as a kind of general planning tool. Got them up right. Y'all don't foresee this being any kind of regulatory. Those decisions, as far as is there capacity for this, is still going to be right. Right. So look, you would still look. Uh, we'll still provide the county staff with the definitive answer. You know, obviously these are for informational purposes. I'm sure we'll have a hefty disclaimer on there, but for informational purposes, uh, the final say would be a letter from us or the advice to county staff it's, gets incorporated into the review uh, carried from there. Right. That's why we kept them kind of bland with just the colors. We don't put any numbers on here as far as REUs available, past, et cetera. Um, trying to keep them as simple as possible, too. Easy to understand. This, this will at least encourage folks who have questions about capacity on you know, one of those yellow ones. Hey, I better call, I better call the folks at the JWC up. We, need to, we found out with our tax maps online that as the lines get good and bright, <laughs> that is gospel, even though it's, it's may or may not, you know. Yeah. But I, I think, I mean, you know, just so everybody's up front, this isn't the, this isn't whether you're taking to the plan, to the planning commission saying, hey, look, I'm in a great place. And Correct. That's still going to be a decision as to point by point. That's, point that's point a good point. point. That's a very good point, Bob, because you can turn in a green basin, you come in needing 100 taps, and there's only 50 available. Better be talking to somebody before you go in and <coughs> make your plans. Good point. And I know uh, Will mentioned about <coughs> Ms. Thompson uh, not even accepting applications without having evidence from Joint Warner Sewer. They've done a due diligence up front and explored the capacity of the situation. We're all for that. We're 100% on board with that. We uh, prefer they come in ahead of time rather than after applications submitted and you, know, you hit the back and forth in. Let's get it all done up front. So. That's a good move. We appreciate the county doing that. Any other questions? Thank you. That kind of, that kind of wraps up our presentation today. Uh, we're doing water and sewer. We're trying to answer the questions that you all had. If you've got some specific follow-up questions now or just want to contact us later, feel free. Uh, we do appreciate your votes. and. We'll pass the cat the hat around as you go out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just still want to say, Madam Planning Commission, we certainly appreciate you having this meeting. It's, appreciate we've had a lot of questions and we are very thankful that you were willing to meet with the mainland and the island planning commission. And especially thank you for this <laughs> well, <laughs> We try to we try to find it. Oh, I really that's good. Fun job. Thank you. Can I ask a couple of just side sure. questions? Some neighbors when we speak have asked what's going on over there because there have been some trucks pumping things out over there for a long time. Is there because in only speech there's uh, something uh, and it, you know you just put a new system in out here. They're wondering what what's happening. 
Yes, there is a nice new system. It leaks like a sieve. Uh, we're working on correcting that problem. Uh, we're actually using that as a poster child part of the plans that we have. I'm not getting ahead of some of the things. Uh, is benchmarking my and I stuff to get a little bit uh, tighter viewpoint of the amount of contributions we have from leaking pipes so that we can better direct our funds. The master plan gave us a great overview. Now we've got to drill down a little closer and determine where we need to spend our funds. Uh, from preliminary examination, we determined that that's the 2063 base in East Beach, all drains to the station that we titled 2063. And uh, it had a significant amount of I&I. Yeah. Uh, right now, we have almost fairly dry. So all of this is groundwater, which means it flows 24-7. It's not rain induced. It's not a bed base. It's all the time. And we have uh, partnered with a couple of companies throughout their inducing work. The Caroline Corporation is one of them. And they're uh, doing some injection grouting. They're doing uh, a variety of tasks of light cleaning on the lines, injection grouting, and then flow monitoring as well at the same time. In, in addition to our in-house flow monitor so that we can tighten that base up. We're hoping to use that one as a poster child totally drop. It's a perfect location because it's right up on the Atlantic. So if we can do that at that base, it will give us a strong indicator. So, so, so that's why you're having leak, leaking pipes. It's not inferior product. It's because of the nature of the... <clears throat> there, there are a variety of reasons why. Earlier we talked about corrosive gases, which are omnipresent in the sewer system, especially here in the south on the coast. We have a situation where once the tiniest of leaks start, because of the type of soils that we have, sugar sand, it siphons that sand in, which starts the progressive failure. So it isn't necessarily that I'm saying that the contract put it in bad to begin with. At some point, something failed. Something moved. When it moved, it started to leak. As it started to leak, it exacerbates the problem. The next thing you know, you have a large amount of sand and groundwater coming in until you have a catastrophic failure. We're trying to avoid the catastrophic failure. If you identify it, you can catch it beforehand, and there are technologies that allow us to go inside the pipe and push grouting material. It's a jelly-like substance that mixes with the soil matrix and stops the water and the sand from coming in. So therefore, if you stop the water, you arrest the bedding sand from coming in. Therefore, you stop the problem, which we all see up on top as being a roller coaster ride up and down the person. So, in addition to the pipes that get put in the ground, uh, that we maintain the laterals that serve the individual homes, the piece that goes on private property owners. You know, those things can have problems as well. I've seen folks even turn around and intentionally. Uh, dig them up and connect their drains in their yards to it to get it, get the ground the stormwater out of their yards. So there's a lot of things. Kirk's right. There's a lot of things that could make a brand new system. In fact, one of my first challenges when I got into the water and sewer utilities a thousand years ago, we had put in a brand new federal grant system in one of the rural areas of the county where I was at. Three years after we put it in. Every time we had a heavy rain, the system was overwhelmed. So we go through and we smoke test it. We find at least a half a dozen places where people were draining their yards using our sanitary sewer. But you can't make very much progress at no. <laughs> every time you do something. Last question, I promise. No, that's right. What about the sewers on Sea Island? Because yeah. I've been told that that is a major problem on, on Sea Island. That, uh, that everybody, you know, most of the houses are on uh, septic tanks. I, I, I don't know. I know there's, uh, there may be, I don't know the specifics of any problems. Uh, I know I'd love for them to tell me they need to jump on our <coughs> system if we've got capacity so we can collect those tap fees, but I don't know the specifics of their system. It's 500 houses over there. Five or six hundred on the septic that are on the septic now. Yeah. I don't know how many of them. They can afford tap in. Huh? Sir? Yeah, I, I believe they can. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Thank I you think that was very way. informative. Uh, I got some clarification on quite a few things also. And, uh,
there's nothing else. I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.